and all the time. Amen. What a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord together to worship uh, in this space and to lift our voices in praise to him. So we are so glad that each and every one of you are here. We're glad for everybody who is worshiping with us online this morning. Uh, and I've just got a couple of announcements, some things that are coming up uh, that I want you to know about in these coming weeks. First of all, I just want to say a big thank you to any of you uh, who came and donated blood on Wednesday. It was a gorgeous day uh, to have the blood van outside. I sat out there in a chair for about the first hour just enjoying the sunshine. Uh, so we had some folks who came from the neighborhood, folks that were passing on by, and I know a few of you as well. So we are grateful uh, for that. I also want to say a huge thank you to Sue Fabian uh, for planning and leading our Wednesday night game night. It was a whole lot of fun. Um, she had all kinds of games for us to play that we could play socially distant and safely, and she even had fun prizes uh, for us to take home. So that was a good time of fellowship. In that same vein, though, I want to let you know that this Wednesday night, we will be resuming our Wednesday night Bible study on Zoom. Uh, we'll continue for six weeks uh, to finish the book of Acts, and that should get us up close to Easter. So even if you have not been joining us for the book of Acts, this is an easy book for you to jump right into. We'll get you caught right up. So Wednesday night at 630, uh, we'd love for you to join us on Zoom. Also want to let um, our youth who are here this morning know that we are going to be gathering tonight with the youth from St. Paul uh, to pack backpack bags for the children over at Summit Drive. So that'll be tonight at six o'clock. If you are someone who has a youth in your family uh, or in your household and you would like them to be involved, you'll just let me know. We would love to get them connected. We send out emails every other week uh, that let our youth know what activities we have planned, what gatherings we have uh, with our friends over at St. Paul. And if you would like to receive those emails and are not, we would happily put you on that email list. So just let me know. Uh, finally, the best news of today, the Girl Scout cookies will be here next Sunday. So if you ordered Girl Scout cookies from Jill last week, uh, they will arrive next Sunday. If you are planning to pay by credit card, Susie will call you this week and take care of those details. So not to worry on that front if you have not uh, gotten all paid up and settled yet. So, all right. Well, this morning we are continuing on in our series uh, during the season of Lent, where we are focusing together uh, on the subject of prayer, something that we talk a lot about uh, and yet often don't spend a lot of time thinking and truly uh, learning about. We think we know all there is to know about something seemingly as basic as prayer. Uh, but in these weeks that lead up to Easter, we are diving deeper uh, to help to grow and strengthen our prayer lives. So as we enter in time of this Lenten worship together, would you stand and join us as we sing together, Here I Am to Worship. You learned the beginning last week. We're going to add it all together. So sing along where you feel comfortable. We, I love getting to hear you from up here.
Would you remain standing as we open together with our call to worship? Today we step up a little higher on our Lenten journey. We are moving from contemplation to action. Are you ready to take the next step? Yes, yes we, we are, are ready, ready and trust that Jesus goes with us. Come, let us walk together on this journey toward a life of prayer. Lord, prepare our hearts and our spirits to take this next step courageously in faith. Amen. You may be seated. Every single Sunday morning for a brief moment in time, we come into this space or we gather in the online space together to worship, to step away for just a moment from the concerns of home and of work and of school and the things that we know will be waiting for us uh, when we leave this place once again. And yet we come together in this space seeking a shift from our ordinary lives into the life of the sacred, from the life of doing things to the life of simply just being in the presence of Jesus. And so this morning, we are going to take a few moments, just like we did last Sunday, to dwell in silence, to think and to listen to the ways that Jesus is journeying alongside us on his way to Jerusalem and to the cross and to their resurrection. So this morning, I want to invite you to listen and to think on these questions. Where is God calling you to go? And what is God calling you to do? As we take this time to think and to dwell and to listen to where God is leading us, also in this season of Lent, we acknowledge the darkness that runs rampant in our world. The darkness that Jesus too knew all too well as he took this long walk to the cross. And so each week we are confessing and acknowledging something that is broken within our world that we know will be resurrected in the light of Easter morning. And so this week, as we extinguish this candle, we acknowledge the darkness and the pain of injury that is done to the earth and to all of its ecosystems. Let us pray. Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, may we be open to your presence. Give us the strength to make the changes that are needed in our lives and the courage to take on the work of transforming the world. Amen. Well, we know that we are called each and every week to follow in the ways that God is leading us to bring light and goodness to this darkened and hurting world. So this morning, as Jessica plays, I invite you to spend some more moments reflecting on those questions that have been offered. Where is God calling you to go? And what is God calling you to do this week? May you listen and may you respond faithfully.
good morning, church. Our scripture reading this morning is found in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 41 through 46. Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of rushing rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. There he bowed himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. Then he said, go again seven times. At the seventh time, he said, look, a little cloud no bigger than a person's hand is rising out of the sea. And then he said, go say to Ahab, harness your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. In a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind. There was a heavy rain. Ahab rode off and went to Jezreel. But the hand of God was on Elijah. He girded up his loins and ran in front of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last Sunday, we began this new sermon series on prayer based around a series of books written by Pastor Mark Batterson. And we heard the legend of this man named Honey, who drew a circle around himself, who knelt down and who refused to move until God answered his prayer for rain in the midst of a severe drought for his community. And we saw that same trust and that perseverance in the people of Israel as they circled around the city of Jericho again and again and again, trusting that God's promise would be fulfilled, that the walls of Jericho would come a-tumbling down. Both Honey and the Israelites circled the prayer promise of God again and again and again until it came to fruition. And so each week of Lent, we are going to be diving in to a different aspect of prayer. We are going to learn what it means to be faithful and to be persistent in our prayers to God. And this morning in particular, we are going to dive deeply into the importance of actually believing in what we are praying for. So as we prepare our hearts for the word of God this day, would you pray with me? Gracious and holy God. Spirit who we know dwells with us even in these moments in time. We ask that you would pour an extra helping of your spirit upon each of us this day. That wherever it is that you are calling us to go, whatever it is you are calling us to say, whatever it is you are calling us to do, we would be faithful. And we would persist. Holy God, speak through me, with me, and even in spite of me. That above all else, your gospel, your good news, would be preached. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, as I sometimes do, I need your help in answering a particular question to hopefully help me not to feel so alone this day. Now, surely we wouldn't be these kind of people, but have you ever known somebody else who said one thing and then did something completely differently? If you've ever known somebody like that, would you just raise your hand today? Maybe somebody who said they wanted to do something, 
but their actions did not reflect it in any way. I am thinking especially this morning of people who tell you over and over and over again that they are going to commit to a diet. And then they go to the grocery store, and they're good. They get, you know, the head of lettuce and the chicken breast and the low-fat yogurt. But they also sneak in those four boxes of cookies and those two pints of ice cream as a reward. And as soon as they get home, what is the first thing gone out of their pantry? The reward. And all of the healthy stuff is left to go bad in the refrigerator. Again, not that any of us would know anything about that scenario. Or maybe it makes us think of a person who says again and again and again that they are going to start to go to bed earlier so that they will feel better when they get up in the morning. But inevitably, they get caught up in something good on television, and before they know it, it's midnight, and they are just starting to crawl under the covers and close their eyes. As always, they sleepily drag out of the bed in a horrible mood after hitting snooze at least four times, and nothing has changed. I wouldn't know anything about that. Or maybe it reminds you of folks who used to or you currently do work with at your office who say they are going to get something done, a project, a memo, a phone call by Friday at 5, but it's next Wednesday and you're still waiting to receive word that it's been done. It can be frustrating even for us internally when our actions don't echo our words. And it can be especially infuriating for the person who is on the receiving end when what we say and what we do absolutely don't match. So why would we think that it would be any different when it comes to prayer? How do you think God feels when we pray intently for God's will to be done in a particular situation? And then we live as though we don't even begin to believe that God can and God will get it done. Last week, I asked you to do something a little different, possibly, than what you've ever done in your prayer life before. I asked you to choose one person or one situation or something else that was weighing on your heart very heavily that you would be willing to pray for consistently over the course of this season of Lent. To find some time each and every one of these 40 days to lift up before God whatever it was that you had chosen as your prayer focus. And if you weren't here last week, this is an excellent time right now here in this space and the spirit of worship to pick your prayer focus. But if you were here. I hope that you have already begun getting into this habit of praying for whatever it was that you chose every single day this week. And if so, I want to ask you this. Have you prayed just to get the words out of your mouth so you could check off your spoke to God today quota? Or have you prayed as though you believed that what you were praying for would actually happen and God's will would be done? Have you ever prayed in such a way that it was evident even to you that you trusted deep down that God was working and would win in that situation? It's not an easy switch to make in our prayer lives. But it is one that is absolutely integral if we are going to get anything out of praying with God. 
The prophet Elijah is an excellent example of this in the pages of Scripture. Elijah is not somebody that we spend a lot of time with uh, often, and so that means that we don't always know a lot about him. But the majority of his story takes place in the books of First and Second Kings in the Old Testament. And Elijah was a prophet who lived in the northern kingdom of Israel in the time of the kings, as the title of the books indicates. And he saw as his primary calling from God to make sure that the people of Israel, the people of God, weren't mixing their religion with the religious cultures all around them, worshiping whoever they pleased to cover all their bases. Instead, Elijah saw it as his call to encourage them to stay true to the one true God. And so Elijah had this habit that we see coming up again and again throughout his ministry of prophecy. His and God's relationship wasn't passive. So that Elijah would just pray for something. And then he would put his feet up and wait to see what would happen, whether or not God would come through on his promise. Instead, Elijah would pray to God, and then he would act on his prayers. Elijah would pray to God, and then he would act on his prayers, almost as though Elijah expected that God was going to do something with this person or this situation or whatever it is that he was praying for. His action was his way of showing God that he was stepping out in faith, believing that God's will would be done in that particular situation. There is this crazy story in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17 where God sends Elijah to this widow who God promises will feed him. When he gets there, The widow herself is starving, having nothing more than a little bit of baking meal in a jar and a tiny bit of oil in a jug, just enough for her and her son to have as a last meal before they will die of starvation. But Elijah, trusting that God would make good on God's promise and somehow convincing this woman of the same through sharing God's promise with her, tells the widow to go ahead and bake a cake for him. And then there will also be enough for her and her son as well. Sure enough, the woman does it. And God makes good on both prayerful promises, both feeding Elijah and making sure the woman and her son's little bit is multiplied into more than enough for them as well. Here we see Elijah acting on the prayer and the promise before it's been answered, making sure his actions match his words, asking a poor widow to feed him. Because he believes that God's will will be done. Not one chapter later, Elijah finds himself in a kind of prickly situation where he is attempting to convince the people of Israel and anyone else who is gathered and is listening in that God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth, is the one, the true, the only God. So Elijah assembles hundreds of prophets that are associated with the famous idolatrous gods Baal and Asherah. And he challenges them to a duel at the pyre of sacrifice with all of the people of Israel standing by them to watch. 
And Elijah says, let's create two altars, one to your gods and one to mine. And whoever's God sends down a rain of fire onto this sacrifice, we will acknowledge all of us together as the one true God. The prophets of Baal and Asherah, they stand out there and they try just about everything. They shout to the heavens for hours. But their gods never answer. Nothing ever happens. Elijah then sets up his altar to God Almighty with stones symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel and this beautiful trench surrounding it. And then he does the unimaginable. Having his servants not once, not twice, not three times, bear big jugs of water to pour all the way over the altar and to fill the trench all around. Because he knows that if he has this sodden altar and fire comes down from heaven and catches it on fire, there will be no way to doubt. That it is an act of God. And so then as he has been praying all along, he audibly cries out to God so that the crowd can hear, Answer me, Lord. Answer me. So that these people will know that you are God. And fire falls in such a way and catches that altar on fire that everyone who is standing around can't help but fall to their knees in worship. Here we see Elijah acting on the prayer and the promise before it's been answered. Making sure his actions match his words. Challenging false prophets to a duel and pouring water on an altar because he believes that God's will will be done. Then in today's account that Kevin read for us this morning, we see the prophet Elijah Immediately on the heels of the last Baal trumping miracle, getting ready to pray to God for relief from the drought the community has been experiencing together for much too long. Already in chapter 18, verse 1, God has promised Elijah that finally rain is going to fall to the earth. Here we see Elijah praying again that it would be so. But Elijah doesn't just pray with his lips for God's promise to be fulfilled, for God's will to be done. What does Elijah do as well? He sends his servant up to the highest point on Mount Carmel to look out over the sea for a rain cloud to come. And the servant comes back and he utters something along these lines. Um, Mr. Elijah, there's nothing to see. But Elijah, believing that God is going to fulfill God's prayerful promise, sends the servant up and says, even if you have to go seven times before you see it, I want you to do just that. And sure enough, on the seventh time of that servant going up to the top of Mount Carmel, he looks up and runs back to Elijah with excitement because sure enough, there is a tiny rain cloud that is coming their way. Here we see Elijah acting on the prayer and the promise before it's been answered. 
making sure that his words and his actions, that they match sending a servant to look for rain. Because he believes that what he has prayed for, God's will, it will be done. Now you might be thinking right now, Pastor Rachel, that's really great for Elijah and that time period and the time of scripture, but that doesn't really work in our world right now. There's no way it would make a difference to act on a promise or a prayer that we've been praying. Making our actions match our prayerful words. But friends, I know of this historically black United Methodist Church right here in Greenville, South Carolina. Nearly comparable in size to us here at Northside. And finding themselves aging and losing momentum, they had felt for some time God laying on their hearts this desire to get more children back into their fellowship. And so for months, they gathered and they held times of prayer to pray for just that. God, please send us some children that we might reach them in your name and our fellowship might grow. And if you went to this church and you asked them, they would be honest with you that they got discouraged. Because no fruit seemed to be coming. No change seemed to be happening. They were convinced that God wasn't going to answer their prayer. Until one day, somebody in the congregation had a suggestion. Maybe we need to not just pray, but to do something. To show God that we believe he's actually going to answer our prayer and show up. And so in a church with nearly no children, on a Saturday afternoon, they gathered together and they painted a room in their building in bright colors. They set up a bookcase in the corner with age-appropriate reading materials. They bought toys for play by children they didn't even know. And then they recruited a children's leader. And you know what happened? Less than a month later, a family came to Sunday morning worship looking for a home church. And they went up to somebody in the congregation. And they said, do you all have anything for children? And the member just smiled. And they walked them downstairs. And they showed them the room that they had prepared. And there sat the children's leader that had been waiting for the prayer to be answered. And you know what? That church now has so many children that that room is full. So maybe it's time that we stop just praying with our lips. And we start also acting on those prayers with our lives. How would your prayer life change if you believed that God would answer so deeply in your soul that your actions 
matches your prayerful words. May you believe in what you are praying for. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. morning we have the opportunity to take that first step to spend some moments in time here in our sanctuary together to pray over whatever it is either for this congregation or in your personal life that you want to lift up before God but we know that that prayer doesn't end here in these pews it doesn't end in these moments of worship. This morning we pray as well that as we leave this place, God would give us that next step of faith of how we can show him that our actions confirm we believe that his will will be done. So this morning, would you join me as we pray. Gracious and holy God, the one who shaped and formed us, the one who breathes into our lungs the literal breath of your life that we might carry with us all of our days a piece of who you are. God, we come before you this morning, your humble servants, seeking to be faithful in prayer, seeking to get down on our knees and draw that circle and say, oh God, we will not move until your will is done. God, to do things that reflect in our actions that we believe that whatever it is we are praying for over these 40 days that you would bring to fruition to paint the classroom and expect the children to come. To pray over that person in our lives and then to reach out to make sure they have someone by their side. To lift up before you that situation that we just can't get out of our minds, but then to take a step of faith to do something about whatever that situation is. As has often been our prayer, we pray that you would make us a people who are brave. Not people who shrink back in fear and worry and concern, but people who know and who trust and who believe that you will go with us through whatever you are leading us into. That all it takes is that first step to show you that we are serious, that we truly believe that your will would be done. God, so often we hear that we can be the answer to our own prayers. That we cry out to you, O oh God, and we call you to feed the hungry, that so often you are calling us to do it. And when we cry out for you to fix the problem of homelessness, so often you are calling us to be the first to step out in faith and take the first move. God, we just continue to pray that all of the needs in this community that are not being met, you would open our eyes to see them, to see the people who are hurting who continue to struggle to get up every morning in this time of the pandemic, to put one foot in front of the other, open our eyes to see and nudge us to make that phone call, 
to stop by on the front porch for that visit, just check in to make sure they're doing all right. God, we know that you are the God who is the definition of what it means to be with. You came in your son, Jesus Christ, because heaven was just simply too far away. And you walked among us. You taught us what it was to follow faithfully, to live in the way that you intended. You died. And you rose again. That we might have life forever with you. And God, we thank you for that promise. And the trust that we have in it, that it will be done. that great sense of gratitude this morning. We pray now in the way that your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. truly it is the prayer of our hearts that we would find time each and every day to be holy, to be in the presence of God. And so this morning, would you stand as you are able as we sing together our closing hymn, Take Time to Be Holy.
would you go forth from this place trusting that God is calling you to step out in faith, to take whatever that first step, that first action is that would help your life to match your beautiful words. May you do it this week and be in awe of the way that God responds. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.